welcome to episode 47 of PauseCast. It's Thursday, the 13th of July, 2017. My name is Jessica Alouette, and I use she, her pronouns. Mark is not here with me this week. I think I warned y'all about that last week. Uh, if you didn't catch that, mm, that's on you. <laughs> I am instead, however, joined by not just one, but two special guests. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce John, uh, otherwise known as Yard Gnome 736 John, what's up? Howdy. How's everyone doing Howdy. today? Good. Uh, what pronouns do you use? I use they, them pronouns. I'd also like to introduce our second guest, Johan, otherwise known as Examiner. Hello. Hey, what pronouns do you use? He, him. Perfect. So now that we got everybody kind of established, hi, what's up? This is a show about video games that we do once a week, um, or I do, and everybody else is, uh, everybody else is guessing with me. It's nice to have you guys here this week. I have actually been on every single episode, just in very minute moments. I've been hacking that's into your tr- computer and clipping my. I cell forgot phone. that you ghost produced all the episodes. I'm sorry, that's my bad. That's uh, perfectly fine. <sighs> it's, I like it's to stay so behind easy the scenes. to forget. Like it's so easy to forget that you have a ghost producer, <laughs> but I've got a ghost producer. I forgot. I am Shoot. in fact a producer that is spooky. Wait yeah, a minute. You do, that's... you do some like music stuff too, don't you? From time to time, yes. From time to time, you're like you're part of a band, I think. I think I saw some uh, images of you in a band. Uh, possibly. Yes. Yeah, that would be my Is band. Is that accurate? Yep, that would be my band, uh, Loon Kire. Uh, post rock, post metal, weird stuff, fun times. Not really. Kind of right. sad. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I'll get. We'll get some more info from uh, about that um, from you a little bit later in the show as well. Fantastic, uh, Johan. What do you do? Um, I do absolutely nothing. I sit here and talk on podcasts right now with you. That's what I'm doing right now in the online. <laughs> I love the online. Uh, so this being a show about video games, I suppose we should actually like talk about video games. So never heard of them. Okay. Uh, Johan, I'm going to start with you actually. What have you been playing this week? Um, I've almost exclusively been playing near auto tomato, <laughs> um, borrowed from some friend's Steam library because I'm too cheap to actually buy my own games. <laughs> I mean, I video love... games are expensive, to be fair. That's, like, that's fair, right? Absolutely. At least somebody paid for the copy I'm playing. Yeah. Um, how have you been finding it? Oh, um... I'm really noticing, you know, aside from themes and writing and stuff like that, which I can get into some other times, everyone's gotten into stuff like that. Um, One thing I'm finding that I really appreciate that I've kind of realized that I've missed uh, since I've pretty much become computer-only gameplay, a computer-only player, is there's a really integrated feel to the game. It's almost seamless feeling compared to most other games that I play on the computer, and I'm kind of realizing now that I play that just how much I miss that feeling and how much a lot of other games kind of neglect the importance of making a seamless experience. In When you're talking about seamlessness in this context, what do you mean? Um, like... Stuff like menu interface, um, the way, th- mainly the way the menu and the UI sort of blends into a cohesive experience instead of menus sort of feeling set apart from the game. For instance, a good example is in, say, Skyrim. The UI, when it pops up, will often look, for some degree, a bit different than the world around you, in a sense. I mean, obviously, it's always going to be abstracted from the actual world, but... It feels like it collides with the actual game experience. That's why there's so many Skyrim mods that work to hide the interface as much as possible. Because it's clear that the interface, the menu, uh, the entire user experience outside of actually playing the game itself clashes with the game itself. And Yeah, it's a like very obvious layer of artifice. Right, and you know, aside from the diegetic elements, I don't even know if I pronounced that right... Of, I believe probably. Uh, I think of, so. 
of Near Automata that uh, that kind of help it integrate story wise in general. The way the color grading works, the way it matches the tone and themes, the way the animations into the menu work. It feels less like I'm going out of the game every time I go into a menu. It feels very much like I'm still in the game when I'm going through the menus. And I think in a game like that, where you can spend a lot of time in the menus, that's very important. And I feel like a lot of development studios that work primarily on computer games neglect that entirely. If I may, just to give a little bit of a a detail to what what you're explaining there, and I just... If I get anything wrong, this is secondhand knowledge because I haven't gotten around to playing the game yet. One of the things that I understand is uh, like your upgrade system is done through like these upgrade chips, and upgrades cost points. And you can go so far as unequipping parts of your UI to free up inventory space or to free up yeah, space actually, for points for your upgrade. You can actually go even further than that like because... Everything in the game is considered a chip, including like the central OS of your characters, which if yes. you remove, you die. Absolutely. Like, that, that is a fantastic touch, and I think that is perfectly what you were discussing there. Just the, uh, the cohesion, the, the yeah, dedication the, to it is incredible. There's another thing that's really like, interesting in Nier's UI as well, is that like, um, the setup process, uh, like choosing all your settings and like, is your is this volume fine and all that? When it guides you through all those settings, it's in the context of an in-world, like, scenario. Yes. Like, the menus all feel like they are part of that experience rather than this, the, the separated thing that is so typical of games like Skyrim and whatnot. Yeah. That's good, though. It's good. It's, this is good stuff. And, uh, um, and I'm yep. just a little bit curious. Uh, did you ever play the original Nier? It said, I think you said you were largely a PC gamer for for, yeah. for a while? Um, yeah, I never really owned a PlayStation 3 for the most part. I guess give me, I'm giving a bit of a record here. Um, okay. Up until around 2010, the only game platforms I've ever owned were Nintendo platforms and once I owned a PS2. So everything outside of that until 2010 when I got an actual computer that could actually play games, just assume I wasn't able to play it outside of those. Honestly and truly, outside of, I don't know, maybe Halo, you're not missing that much just getting a PlayStation 2 Nintendo consoles and a PC in 2010. You can play like 95% of the classics at that point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That was actually the end of the statement. <laughs> uh, that actually does remind me, and I was actually going to go through uh, to clarify what I said, that not even just the diegetic elements that made it feel cohesive, because what it reminds me most of are, in terms of seamlessness, is the way first-party Nintendo games often feel seamless, um, if that makes any sense. It does, actually. It, does. it reminds me of um, Super Mario Sunshine. The start screen was like... You had a little, uh, you had the Mario that you had to move between all the save boxes and you jumped up to select the save box. That was a cool little detail. Absolutely. I th- is that the sort of thing that you're talking about? Um, that, that helps with that. Um, I do remember I recently did get to play uh, on a borrowed copy of uh, Breath of the Wild on a friend's Switch that I was able to meet with a few months back. Um and that actually kind of has it as well, but without the diegetic elements to it, uh, where uh, it's hard for me to really put my finger on what elements caused it to feel seamless, so much as it just feels out of the way without not existing, if that makes right. any sense. I would argue the fact that you can't put your finger on an exact element that defines what you're saying is part of what makes what you're speaking right. on so good is that it is literally just embedded into the feeling of the game in every avenue. And I, I'm sorry if I'm taking control of the topic right away. No, no, it's fine. It's your turn. I think that's how this works. <laughs> uh, but I was just sort of contrasting the way near Automato does that. Um, Near avocado. <laughs> and a bit of a sidetrack. I do that because everyone makes fun of me with how I pronounce automata. So 
That's why I deflect to that. You pronounced it like a normal human being. What the fuck no are you talking about? Every, pronounce it. Everybody uh, that I've said that to has told me, oh, you mean automa- automata? It's like automata. Uh, near automata. Oh, you no, mean go to f- bed? Why are we having this discussion? <laughs> yeah. It's not a real word? <laughs> Calm down. Wait, that's... <laughs> fuck. But, yeah, I was just realizing... And, you know, I can also say... It gives you a surprising, not the best depth in settings tweaking that you can get compared to other, you know, PC games. Yeah. But I'm not used to because when I get that sort of UI experience, I'm sort of used to not being able to tweak things. So yeah. I'm at least a, I was a little bit surprised at how well the settings side of the menu was, and. Um, I think that kind of goes back to sort of the expectation that a lot of PC gamers will have regarding that, where I think one of the reasons why a seamless interface is de-emphasized so much on computer-focused games is because there's sort of a, I don't want to say culture, but an expectation among that market of being able to fine-tune and fiddle with settings to an extreme degree, and having a seamless, streamlined interface because of its association with console platformers gives a lot of PC gamers the impression that it's less robust than what they're hoping for. Mm, yeah, and, I would. I would. Sorry, I was just going to say uh, I. I've got them in the middle ground because I have a PlayStation Four. Also play games on my computer though. But knowing the developer, I would have expected kind of like because Platinum Games for anyone not aware. Uh, generally a console developer, I can only think of one of their games, uh, Metal Gear Revengeance, that made it to PC before this one. And uh, yeah, yes, I would have expected that them one. to not be like super robust in the settings or the modification, or malleability, however you choose to phrase that, of the game. Oh, you know what? Sorry, no, Transformers Devastation. Forgot there you about go. It. I, I think Trans- we all that forgot was about Transformers joint. Devastation. Um, and then after after the release of Nira Tomato, um, uh, we also got Bayonetta yes. and Vanquish on PC. Oh wait, Vanquish is out on PC now. Yes, yeah, dog. Uh, Within the past month or two, it launched with a nice fun bug because uh, that game was originally thirty when it came out. 30 FPS. Oh, shit. It launched. It, it has a 60 FPS bug? Yeah, where you're taking double damage. They may have fixed it at this point, so I don't want to like, they put on the record. That. I remember hearing about that, I think. But that but it was, it's It's very much like Dark Souls. Like, hey, remember when Dark Souls 2 happened and it ran at 60 frames per second for the first time? And because of that, weapons degraded. Double damage <laughs> because it counted as two hits every time it went oh, through. Mm, actually, because the frames are doubled. I actually do remember... Uh, I did pick up Bayonetta in the last sale, but I had to refund it because of, you know, financial issue that came up. I'll be getting it next Mm -hmm. chance I get, obviously. Uh, But yeah, I just wanted to point that out, that I was aware at least that one was available. Now, I'm not going to be picking up the PC port of Bayonetta because I have a nice Switch sitting around waiting for some fancy games. And the rumors of a Bayonetta 1 and 2 compilation for Switch are getting louder and louder every single day. I mean, like Platinum did post that like thing with the uh, the switch colors mm-hmm. and uh, Bayonetta in both of her like looks. Yep. But like, I will say the PC version of um, of Bayonetta is extremely good. The 60 FPS actually is it's. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I've heard it's incredible on the settings, like all kind like native 4K support. Well, oh yeah, you don't no, really... it's like. If you really wanted to get into the like technical front of the bayonetta port, oh yeah, the bayonetta I do. port, it's a choice. <laughs> but it um, bayonetta is a fucking great game. Yes, it I is. have it on the I have it on the Wii U, and it's just it's oh my god, it's so good. I picked um, it up. I picked it up at a GameStop for eight dollars on three sixty. Oh shit! When I was uh, there was a time it was it was a, like two years ago. There was like a there was like a five month lull in games. So I was going to GameStop and picking up ten dollar games. That's how I played Max Payne Three. That's how I played Bayonetta okay. and a couple other games like that. Fun times. Yeah. Uh, what have you been playing this week, though, Yardno? Okay, this week I've um, been playing a couple different things. Um, go. Ahead. I guess I'll go in a 
smallest to biggest, so to say. I picked up the Crash sure. Bandicoot remaster. I haven't made it super far into that because I'm playing it in order. All of my friends... I've heard that... Sorry, you go ahead. I've heard that that's harder than the uh, original ones. Is that got any veracity to those rumors? Um, I absolutely believe so because the game was not... It's important to remember when the game came out. First of all, it was one of the earliest 3D platformers. And second of all, it came out on the PlayStation 1 before the original DualShock, so before an analog stick. The game was right. very much meant for a D-pad. Like, it was literally only for a D-pad. This new game has no code from the original. It's not, it's, it's not a remaster. It's a complete remake in a brand new engine. And with right, that, yeah. they brought a new handling model that does not work in the first game. I feel very Oof. strongly about this. There will be moments where I'll be pressing the left D-pad button because I'm playing it how I did originally. Some people will think I'm weird for not using the analog stick. Eh. But um, I'll be running along what is supposed to be a straight line and all of a sudden veer off to the right and die. Yeah. Because the, it doesn't control the same. Uh, and and my friends who have made it further in, which uh, they say just abandon the first one, go ahead and go to the second and the third. They fixed that problem. Those games were built with 3D controls in mind. But the thing is, first of all, Crash Bandicoot is literally what got me into video games. Like mm. I had a PlayStation for a full year, didn't touch it until someone got me a, a copy of Crash Bandicoot. Right, so if, does it feel like it like you'd be like disrespecting a piece of your personal gaming history then to like just skip it because it's not something that works anymore? It's more so that I was able to 100% these games when I was six years old. I'm 26 right. now, and I need to prove I'm just as good as I was when I was a child. And so far, it's not looking positive. If I'm being well, completely I, I thought, honest. Uh, as far as I knew, they actually like did increase the difficulty beyond that. Like that's what I've heard. I I could be wrong. No, in fact, like to give you an example, in the original Crash Bandicoot, when you wanted to collect, there were there there were crystals for finishing the level, and then there were also gems for you had to hit all of the boxes in a level. But what made it much okay. harder in the original game is that you had to do it all in one life. If you died at all, even after hitting a checkpoint, you had to start the level over. They've, un they've gotten right. rid of that. The save system is much more forgiving. So I would say outside of like the change to the controls, it's not really any more difficult. Mm -hmm. But um, it's gorgeous. It, 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 is, it is a terribly gorgeous game to the point to where I won't say it's a Pixar movie quality, but it's like DreamWorks TV show quality. It's like Penguins of Madagascar uh, okay. quality. You could see this well, like, game on TV, and I kind of feel like you're going to. This might be like the beginning of a revital of Crash Bandicoot, like how they tried to do with Skylanders. Mm-hmm. I, I I want a I do want Spyro because I haven't played those games. I want a like remake of Spyro to be existing and good. Oh, those uh, are good. I games. also um uh, Ratchet and Clank. I also remember like seeing that in motion, and that's very much like a like Disney movie in motion. Yes, it is yeah. gorgeous. Not I to, have that. Oh, not to interrupt, but just for the record, because I don't know, a bit of a trivia. I find it funny. <laughs> the second Ratchet and Clank game was somehow the first video game that I ever played on a non Nintendo console. Huh? It's a good game because that's the game that came packaged with the person that my dad bought the PS2 from eBay on. Okay. Hey, there's definitely worse games to get. You could have got, like, uh, Tack in the Power of Juju or something. Uh, <laughs> you could have got Gex. Ty the Tasmanian Devil. I played the <laughs> N64 I thought it, version I, I thought it was Ty the Ta Tasmanian, like, Tiger or something, and you could actually, like, get that on Steam, I think. Hey, guess what? I don't know a lot about this obscure platformer for a PlayStation <laughs> 2 from 2003. You could be right. Hey, good news. All four games are just on Steam. <laughs> Tie the Tasmanian Woo. Tiger. Beautiful. Good day, mate. Are you ready to explore the wilds of the Australian outback in this remastered <laughs> version of the classic game? Classic. Tie the Tasmanian Tiger. Who bought the rights to that from EA and put that on Steam for a quick buck? Uh, Chrome Studios. That what may have is... actually just been the original developer. 
They also built some of the Star Wars Clone Wars games that were very bad, it looks like. Oops. All right. Yeah, I, th- I, I could be wrong about that, but I thought it was not p- developed but published by EA. Like, I thought that was their attempt. Yeah, I think they, I think they may have um, been the publisher of that, and then Chrome was the original developer. I don't know. But um, but tie the Tasmanian tiger. <laughs> so bringing it back to it definitely could have been worse. Yeah, but bringing it back to good platformers. Uh, so like I said, I'm a bit into Crash <laughs> Bandicoot. I'm a I'm gonna keep playing on that. Uh, the other things I've been playing this week, uh, the the first DLC for Breath of the Wild just came out recently. Ooh. So I restarted yep. on Master Mode, and they're not joking on Master Mode. It's very okay. hard. Just to, just what sort of changes have been made? Um, I'm trying to remember exactly. To give you a brief example, on the very starting plateau, there's a white line on now. Have fun. Okay. Mm. So, um, All right. So the things that they did is uh, every enemy that spawns, if you remember in Breath of the Wild, there's tiers to enemies. There's like blue enemies, red enemies, black enemies, white enemies. I I don't know if that's the exact order, but every enemy spawn is now one tier up. So a blue is now a red. Um, There's increased. I think you mean. I think you mean the opposite. A red is now a blue. Yeah, I don't remember the exact order. So does that mean they introduced a new enemy tier for the master mode to replace the highest tier? Or I don't believe so. I think it's just you'll have a lot more of the highest tier enemies now. Um, there's also, they've added these floating platforms all around Hyrule. So if you remember the Octo Balloons, I forget exactly what they're called, that you could use That's in the exactly game. what they're called, in fact. There you go. They have, uh, suspended platforms with, some of them have treasure chests on them. Most of them have enemies with all kinds of fancy lightning and fire and bomb arrows to make your life a lot harder as you're crossing bridges. Um, enemies see you from a lot further away is something I've noticed as well. It's just a lot harder. It's a lot harder. Yeah. But I'm enjoying it because I I beat Breath of the Wild with about 130 hours put into it. And by the time I got to the end of that game, or even like the back third, I'd gotten pretty good at playing it. I don't want to call it easy by any means, but I'd gotten pretty good at playing it. So the additional challenge for me is really nice. And the other feature that they added outside of some... Uh, some like collectibles throughout the universe. Like you can get Tingle's outfit and all of the NPCs look at you like you're a weirdo if you're running around in Tingle's outfit, which Mm -hmm. as they should. (laughs) But they also added in a, uh, a multi-tier dungeon called the trials of the sword. And without getting into too much detail for anyone who's concerned about any level of spoilers, I want to be respectful of that. You go to a special place with a special item and and it lets you enter these trials where the game strips you of all of your items and you have to work Mm -hmm. with what you go in with. And I think it's like 45, maybe 50 floors of increasing difficulty of wiping out enemies and surviving encounters with literally what you can find and the powers that you go in with. Terribly fun. I haven't made it past like level 10. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I've heard that the, I've heard the new dungeon is quite a, like, lot. That I've is, heard it's a lot. That is definitely a way to put it. Capital A lot. <laughs> it, it strips you of all your stuff, right? Like, it's like yep. even Tide Island? Exactly. I didn't want to go into too much specifics, uh, just out of, okay. out of my own personal concern. But, uh, yeah, it's no, just, fair. it's just like even Tide Island. Um, when you step foot in, you're stripped of all of your armor, all of your food, all of your weapons, everything except your runes. Okay. So if you have the upgraded, like, bomb runes and stuff, you'll still be able to keep those. Yeah, and it the game kind of time gates it. I'm not exactly sure when you would unlock the ability to go in there because I, I'm loading the game from a final save. Uh, so, but it seems like it time gates you to a certain point where it's not going to let you in there probably before you have all of those upgraded runes. Okay. So yeah, I've been messing around in that. Uh, The other game I picked up was I've been playing Warframe. A bunch of my friends have gotten into that because they announced a big content patch coming out towards the end of the year. And it's just Destiny now. It's literally just Destiny. They've introduced a massive open world. It's Destiny now. It's Destiny. It's Destiny. But that's okay. If you wanted Destiny, you could play Destiny though. 
the movement in Warframe is incredibly fun. Like, the whole aesthetic mm. they're going for is, like, fast ninjas, and it nails that. There's all kinds of, like, bullet dodging and sliding and jumping. It, it's fun. It's fun in a really grindy, mindless way. Don't really have much for more sure. to say uh, on it, about it on... Uh, sorry, I can't talk. Don't really have much more to say about it than that, but I'm enjoying my time with it. But the thing I've been spending the most time with is Battlegrounds. Just, I've been spending a lot of time with that myself. Ooh, just this morning, uh, less than 24 hours ago, I pulled off my first solo victory, and I have never felt more alive in my entire life. It is potentially my greatest accomplishment ever. That may speak ill of me, but I don't care. <laughs> That's fair. It is an absolutely incredible game. I've won one solo match, two duos, and two squads. And yes, I am bragging on record. Everyone talk about how good I am. No. Hey, I won a uh, squad game on my first night. Like, I got that's, chicken dinner in my second game. Wow, that's incredible. Ever. Wow, we need to partner um, up some. <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely need to partner up some because I would love to get some chicken dinner with you. It's, it's uh, the best. Spicy chicken. I think I talked... I talked last week, I think, about the um, Winters mode. Oh, that, yes. Um, some of the Waypoint crew have been playing. Um, if you want to read about that real quick, it's bit.ly slash PUBG Winters. Highly recommend. A, uh, I highly recommend it. It's so much fun. If you're playing in squads, check out Winters. It is a fantastic way to play. Really good at generating some awesome stories as well. Like, this game is so good at, like, generating those. Big, long, kind of epic stories. I hate using the word epic, but I'm going to have to use it here. It's just it, 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 it fits. Just because the internet has overblown it doesn't mean that you don't get to use it in times when it's genuinely applicable. And that is Battlegrounds. Yeah, no, it's, it, it does make for some really, really epic stories. Just because the best. Because it has this... It, oh my god. I, it's genius <laughs> because of the pacing. The pacing is what keeps Battlegrounds genius. Yes. Like, that's the biggest... It's the biggest thing that it's brought to Battle Royale as, like, a game genre. Uh, I think... Uh, I haven't talked about this on stream. PUBG is going to be around for a long time, I think. I don't have any real concerns about its, like, long-term sustainability at this point. Yes. I don't either. Because the thing... The thing about it is, one, it's, like, geniusly designed, and two, like, Battle Royale is a thing that is, like, very much in our culture. Yes. It has been for a grip, like, The Hunger Games, the actual, like, Battle Royale book and movie. I only just recently found out that there was a book. I only thought there was the, like, Battle Royale movie. Do you know about the sequel movie? I, no. It's not good. Okay, so let's we don't have to acknowledge that, but we can acknowledge the like cultural impact of Battle Royale and the like we understand how this game operates, yes, at this point, and it's all variations on a theme. Battlegrounds has nailed this to the ground and has this like genuinely incredible pacing to it, absolutely, it makes it so much fun to play. So have you discussed much of the history of it? Not to get too much into detail. because I haven't. No, let's, let's get into some detail. What do you know of the history of PUBG? So here's, my, here's the perspective that I bring to the game. Um, the titular player unknown, uh, he's much more known nowadays. He, his name is Brendan Green. Uh, the very first incarnation of this game was a mod for DayZ when it was an Arma 2 right. mod. So there was... Oh my god, it's like, it's, it's a mod on top of... A, it's Inception We are mods. in Modception. Yep. We are in Modception. There you go. But um, once Daisy was spun off to its own thing, uh, Brendan Green took the concept to Arma 3, which has had right. a uh, burgeoning community. But just due to... First of all, Arma is a, it's a military sim at the end of the day. Battle Royale mods, and almost any mod is asking things out of the Arma engine it's never built to do. For example, yeah. jumping is not a thing that it natively exists in Arma. To have jumping okay. to have jumping in Arma 3 Battle Royale, Brendan Green had to mod it into the game. And it's hilarious because there's no jumping animation for when you're unarmed. 
So when you're running okay. around with no weapons, when you jump, literally in the, in the span of a single frame, you go to holding an invisible gun that you sail through <laughs> the air with. And then when you land, you go through a whole animation of putting your invisible gun away because the game has to do that in terms of its own logic. Huh. Yeah. So um, that – but having said all that, just the fact that it was a game fundamentally – like it was a game in an engine that it was fundamentally not built to work in, um, it's had a fantastic community. That's where I got my beginning playing these types of games. In fact, the entire reason I picked up Battlegrounds was not because – and this is going to sound uh, a little maybe hipster ahead of the curve here, but it's not because I saw my friends playing it. But it's because I'd put hours and hours into Arma 3 Battle Royale, and I saw Battlegrounds, and it's like, oh, God, that's a functioning version of the game? I have Hell to go yeah. get it. They actually um, they use the Arma 3 Studios um, mocap studio, I yes. believe, now um, to handle some of the animation. So, like, Bohemia Interactive, who make Arma 3 and all of the Arma series, actually just has lent um, PlayerUnknown's Blue Hole um, the... Uh, mocap studio did you know that blue hole is the studio behind that mmo terra wait what? yes they've put out three games they've put out terra they put out and i'm and i'm gonna be a little maybe harsh to the game i honestly don't know that much about it but it basically looks like terra but it's a diablo clone and then battlegrounds is their third title huh well, quite a repertoire huh. right hmm that's hmm. hmm. That's a that's a very weird repertoire. Honestly and truly, yeah. I just got curious about the developer one day, went to their website and saw that's what they've made. I just assumed Blue Hole was whatever name that uh, Player Unknown gave to the studio. That you know, because no, yeah, yeah honestly, same. Nope, it's a pre-existing I, studio out of uh, South Korea. And in and fact, that's where he lives about, now. And if I didn't know about Player Unknown's battleground, I would have assumed Blue Hole was a was a nickname for Ubisoft. <laughs> if, I would have assumed... Mm, nah, I was going to make a goof here, but nah. I think, nah. I think you just did. And I think we're, okay. we're all going to process it silently. Listeners okay. at home, you can, you can have that one. We have that one. And we'll just move on with our lives. Yes, let's absolutely just move on as fast as we can without thinking too much about the blue hole. I, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> So that was the worst. <laughs> what <am I> <laughs> while, while we uh, escape from Player Unknown's blue hole. Sorry. <laughs> oh no. I'm stuck in the blue hole. <laughs> listen, listen. The the circle. That's actually its name. It's Player Unknown's blue hole. <laughs> that's. <laughs> It's constantly closing in on you. We are getting <laughs> we are getting into the deep, deep lore of, of Battlegrounds here. <laughs> this is the deepest the deepest lore possible. It's the deepest blue um. hole. <laughs> God damn it. I hate it. I'm sorry. The crater in the middle of the blue hole. <laughs> Delete this episode. Wait a minute, we're live. Delete the internet. <laughs> I have to hang on. Uh, I've opened a command line and I am entering delete twitch dot TV. Okay, it's gone. We're good. Problem solved. We did it. Crushed it. But that has been my video game experience the, over the past week or two is uh, uh, mainly Breath of the Wild, some Warframe, and murder. Murder Island. Murder. Not yet. <sighs> Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is very good. Yeah, that's the thing. It is. It is a terribly fantastic game. I recommend to anyone, um, even if you're not a shooter person, there. This game operates on levels that you've probably never experienced in a game. Just look. I mean, at everyone playing it. Just look at how many if, people are playing this game, and I don't mean like appeal to the masses. I'm talking about look at all the the types that you would never expect to be doing daily broadcasts of a first person shooter. Waypoint. And they're loving it. There's something to be said about this game. It, it, it's far beyond... It's more than the sum of its parts. That's exactly what I want to go for there. For, for some yeah. extra context regarding what you were talking about there, um, during the most recent Steam Summer Sale, 
which it's the summer sale. This is like the second biggest sale of the year for Steam. Player Unknown's Battleground somehow, without going on sale, managed to top the sales charts during the yep. sale. And I'm pretty sure a bunch of that comes from people who were waiting for the sale, assuming it would go on sale, and they saw it was at full price, and they were just like, well, I'm not going to wait for it to go on sale. And yeah, I mean, no. it's only $30 to begin with. It's not even a full price title. It's still, it still like is inaccessible to some people. Right. Though, Absolutely. I, yeah, I'm not trying to be dismissive of, of that by any means, but just for more context, they're not even asking sixty dollars for this bag of japes that they're that they're giving you. Yeah. No. Um, even if shooters are like extremely not your thing, I would maybe recommend watching some people. Um, I'm definitely going to recommend the uh, Waypoint series Breakfast in Battlegrounds. Absolutely. You can you can watch uh, Crowbar and Sickle tear through. Um, Tear through Murder Island. A father and son yeah. murder mystery adventure. And the mystery really is good. how many people will they murder? They got chicken dinner. Off stream. Not on, not on Off Breakfast in Valentine's. Did you, did you see um, Patrick's recording? Patrick got a recording of it. Yes, so, like, I did. They have them on record winning chicken dinner. Austin was so upset. They both were. This... Uh, th- it's, it's hilarious hearing the mixture of their utmost joy, because correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the first victory for both of them. It's the first, well, it's the first victory for them as a team. They've definitely won chicken dinner independently from one okay. another, but they have not won it together until that point. Okay. But you can hear just this unique blend of sheer joy, because winning in Battlegrounds is, is an incredible feeling. A lot. Um, Obviously, my Twitter's linked here. If you go, you can find footage of my victory. It's quite embarrassing, if I'm honest. I didn't know my mic was on, and I scream a lot. <laughs> but you can hear a excellent. you can hear a unique blend of just unadulterated joy, and yet, like, damn it, we didn't get this on the stream. They're mad and joyful at the same time in the most unique, beautiful way. Battlegrounds is fucking. So choice. Yeah, at least at least give it a shot. Another recommendation, if you're a Giant Bomb Premium subscriber, is their Murder Island streams. Uh, although, if you're a Giant Bomb Premium subscriber, you're probably already watching that. So, what am I recommending here? Who knows? Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna get into what I have been uh, I've been digging into a little bit Absolutely. myself this week because I haven't I haven't done that yet. But here, here's the here's the situation. It's mostly battlegrounds. <laughs> Um, Went over that. It's yeah, we've been over that, but like, there's a lot to talk about in it. There's uh, Overwatch, which I've been playing more of. I ended up playing like ten matches or so today, and I won basically all of them, which has been a huge improvement over just every other time I've picked up the video game recently. I've seen some fantastic Diva Play clips from you recently. Just want to give <sighs> you, just want to give you that props on your show. I want everyone listening to know. You got a good diva here in Jessica. Oh, fuck off. No, you fuck off. It was, you fuck <laughs> off. It was a lucky play. Take and the I compliment. Um, the, those mercy headshots were very good, though, I will say. Um, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, which I, I continue. Uh, like, I jumped back into the campaign because I, I made some progress in it a while ago. And you know, I just went back in. Yes. That game does some stuff. It really does. I, conti- I continue to be impressed with that game's campaign. It is astonishingly good. It is... It, the fact that it does take moments to be, like, somber, um, even in the face of, like, vast existential terror, mm-hmm. is just... Mm, it's so good! That game is so good. I almost like here here's a here's a confession for you. I almost cried during a Call of Duty campaign in one of these <laughs> moments. It's I almost I almost did that. You know, I've played through the game myself and um I may know which time you're talking about. We don't need to get I will, into it. I'll like PM you real quick oh, so yeah. that you know. But like Yeah, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare is it's overtaken. Call of Duty 4. Mm-hmm. I'm midway through. That's, hmm. Now, I think Call of Duty 4 is one of the 
10 best games ever made. Oh, no. I I would say that, like, Modern Warfare's campaign is super duper up there. Yes. But also, I think, quite legitimately, Infinite Warfare has actually taken that bar that COD 4 has set, and it has raised it in a way in like that Call of Duty has not seen for years. I absolutely agree with you in terms of how fantastic the campaign is. I will unequivocally say I feel it's the best since uh, Call of Duty 4. And I think it's up I, there. I, uh, I'm not sure how yeah, I... Yeah, I'm willing to put... Sorry? I'm willing to put it above it. That's Fair where enough. that's where I'm going to go. And I c- I'm I could to see say it's I could see there. why you would do that because I did an interesting thing. Uh, Target did a buy two get one free sale on games uh, last year, and I picked up Overwatch was one of them, but that's inconsequential to the story. I picked up Titanfall two, and I picked Ooh, up yeah. the collector's edition of Modern Warfare, or not Modern Warfare. I picked up the collector's edition of Infinite Warfare, which also came with Modern Warfare Remastered. Which yeah, for sure. is the people that would go on to make Titanfall 2. Because even though, Infini- yes. even though Infinity Ward is still the same studio, it's not the same people. So I wanted to play no, they, all there of was those. a huge like falling out with Activision and Infinity Ward like yeah. years and years ago at this point, right? It was during the development of Modern Warfare 2. Okay. Yeah. And I wanted to pick up all of those games because I wanted to compare and contrast them. You know, like Titanfall 2 to Call of Duty because that's the same developers. And this is the first single-player campaign they'd made since Modern Warfare 2. And then also, I've got Modern Warfare Remastered to compare to Infinite Warfare. I've got Titanfall. I just wanted to compare them all. And that was a fantastic little exercise. Um, But Infinite Warfare's campaign surprised me with how fantastic it was, and it breaks my heart that the reception to the game has been less than positive because of largely the multiplayer. So I'm terrified Activision sees this and goes, oh, people don't want that. We don't, we're not going to try that again. Mm Mm-hmm. Because this is is the Call of Duty with selectable side missions. Like, this is a Call of Duty with, like, open world flying sections that are completely controllable. This is a Call of Duty where I genuinely care about the side characters. Yeah. It, 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 it's nah. a fantastic game. It's good shit. It's really good shit. And I just checked your PM, and that is exactly the moment I was thinking of. Yep. It's so fucking choice. It, like, it's, like I said, I don't know how much I care for the Jon Snow overarching story. It's, it's completely functional. It serves its purpose. Oh, yeah, no, that part is functional, but that's it's the same way in which Titanfall 2 is functional. Titanfall 2 has this overarching narrative, which is functional, but it's the stuff in the middle that really makes that campaign special. Effect and cause makes that game special because it it is its own self-contained story in that moment. Yes. And the, like, return to Titan... Uh, this is the specific mission in Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. Beyond that, I'm not giving any details, but the Return to Titan mission is its own self-contained story, and there's the setup to it, and there's like personal context involved. Yes. And there's these scenes which are just so choice, and it is all this stuff in the middle that makes this game special. It's these... It's not this Jon Snow overarching narrative, yeah. as you mentioned. It's it's all the stuff in the middle. It's And again, it's the same with Titanfall 2. Yeah. Titanfall 2, there's nothing really special going on in the overarching narrative, and it's all the stuff in the middle. Final Fantasy X, there's nothing really, like, super interesting going on in the overarching narrative. It exists, and it, like, gives you framing for all the stuff that's happening, but it's all the stuff in the middle that makes everything in that narrative Worth giving a fuck about. Yeah. To me, Titanfall 2 is a dating sim between me and my robot boyfriend, BT. And That's accurate. And in the multiplayer, it's a dating sim between me and my robot wife, Tone. Mmm. <laughs> you're, to- you're one of those Tone players? I've I been, pla- I've been playing Tone since launch. I was playing Tone before anyone knew she was overpowered, and I don't play Tone how most play- Tone players play her. I play her up close and aggressive. So, I know what you're going to say. Shut up about my robot wife. She was absolutely overpowered. <laughs> I'll fight you in a Ronin any day. I will 
throw down my particle wall and melee you to where you literally can't get through my shield. Fight me, IRL. Meet me. One v one name, robo duel. Name the IHOP parking lot. That's the only. <laughs> that's the only place that I can fight. It's like Highlander, except the opposite. <laughs> There's no quickening involved. Well, it is in my fights. I don't know okay. what you're doing. Um, the other thing I've been playing this week has been, like, uh, I finally ticked a game off my list that I've had on it for, like, no joke, five years. That's oh. uh, a bit of a shame. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's Torchlight, the original. I oh. finally beat it. So that's, um, that's just just making sure I'm thinking of the right game. That's... Not Diablo. Diablo style. Okay, I've heard nothing it's but positive not Diablo, about it. but it's 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 very similar to Diablo, and it actually borrows a few like structural things from it beyond like some of the core mechanics. Structurally, um, Torchlight takes place in kind of a dungeon that's all set underneath one town, so there's one real like central location, and then there's a few environments below the town, basically. Interesting. Uh, I believe that was the structure of Diablo 1. Uh, that's my understanding, was, yeah. Uh, it was like the set dungeons. Yeah. Uh, it's randomly generated, which is cool. But it it is all just like set beneath this one town. There's only like one kind of hub location that you're going to and from. So I, I guess... There's cats and dogs and stuff too. It's good. I guess it clicks well. Because that's really what you come to those games for. Yeah, you, you come to it for a meat grinder. Yeah, and I guess it's it's good at that. Because I want to be clear, I don't it's dismiss a, these games. I have 1,500 hours in Destiny. No, it's a good meat grinder, <laughs> is the thing about uh, Torchlight. Yeah. Um, I had I had a blast finishing that off this week. I actually spent some... Uh, I, I spent a little bit of time actually finishing it. Got the final boss. There you go. Uh, I'm nowhere near the, like, level 100 cap and the second dungeon, which is the, like... It picks all the environments randomly and picks all the enemies randomly and puts together like a a grab bag okay. of uh, a dungeon. So I haven't really gotten through that all that much, but I'm looking forward to giving that a shot. And do you think you'll be going on to the sequel? Uh, I plan on it. I've got a like group together, so I actually will probably be playing Torchlight Two uh, co-op. That sounds like a fun experience. Yeah, we have like five people probably ready to uh, all group together and do some uh, do some meat grinding. So it should be it should be an all right time, I reckon. Yeah, there you go. I am personally just waiting for a new Titan quest. Right, let's get on that. If we're talking about Diablo clones, okay. <laughs> I have not played Titan Quest. It's um, it's it's a Diablo clone with like a uh, a Greek theme, you know, fighting gods and medusas and that kind of stuff. It's it was published by THQ if I remember correctly. Uh it, it's that's accurate. It was a, it was a Diablo clone but in the long gap between Diablo 2 and Diablo 3. That's a lot of what led to its notoriety, but it was I don't want to dismiss it because it was a completely good game. It just didn't have oh, yeah. the highest aspirations. Mhm. Feel like I'm talking down on it. It's fun. No. Nah. I don't feel like you're talking down on it. I, like, you're being honest about how you feel. Like, yeah. Hey, it's maybe it's maybe not got the loftiest aspirations, but it's filling a gap that was like present for people. Yeah. I think Grim Dawn was filling that as well. Like, people were after a Diablo two style experience. After Diablo three was not what a lot of people were expecting out of that. Yeah. And then Grim Dawn was like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna fill this gap." And then Titan Quest would have been something like, we're going to fill this gap in a unique and interesting way. Definitely. Because a, a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of Diablo style games will fall into that trap of just wanting to be Diablo, but necessarily with a different rapper, you know, like it'll still be about those dark dungeons and there'll be demons and overcast. Yeah. So just the, the change to like the Greek pantheon is in and of itself somewhat refreshing because it was a kind of a time and place game. I don't know how much I would recommend it to someone now because you probably just either play, go play Diablo 3 now that it's in a good state or you'd go play Torchlight 2, any number of other titles. But if you like those kind of games and you're looking for something, I could recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I still want to play a bunch of the old like CRPGs I've got sitting around in my library. Like I've I've got the old Fallout games and I've got some of the old like Infinity stuff like I've the Baldur's Gate, Arcanum, um and more recent like the more recent stuff like Pillars of Eternity. I have all of these sitting around in my library just kind of waiting to be played and I do want to get around to them at some point. Is uh, uh but uh, is oh, is Planescape Torment first. on that list? I believe I have that on GOG, and I just haven't made a shortcut for it. But yes, Planescape Torment is on that list. That I do not have the enhanced edition of that. Ah, that is like to me, either that or Fallout Two are the, like the the penultimate versions of those CRPGs. Either that, maybe okay. or like a, I don't know. The new Shadowrun Returns was pretty good. Shadow, I hmm. I have some thoughts about Shadowrun Returns. All right. They're not good. Oh, completely fair. Um, okay, I'm getting into this, huh? I mean... Shadowrun Returns... One, okay, one of the biggest problems I had with Shadowrun Returns... I'm going to be quick about this. One of the biggest problems I had with Shadowrun Returns was that Shadowrun Returns' first entire act is just, like... It's the setup for, like, deranged mental patient bullshit. That's definitely true. There's there's no counter to that. You're absolutely right. It's, it's one of the weaker it's points. Like, it's extremely, extremely bad, and it's like six hours of that game is the setup for just some, like, it's an escaped mental patient. Woo-hoo-hoo. Imagine <laughs> how scary that would be in real life. Watch out, everybody. Um, Very valid complaint. Like, Mm, it's bad, is the thing. I, mm, I don't recommend Shadowrun Returns. I don't, just because, like, that first act is fucking insufferable. Um, the second act definitely, like, makes notable improvements, but by then, it also, like... Why do you want to go through the, the first act? The, you could just not. The thread... Yeah, like, the thread also, like, feels very, very loose by the time that you reach that point. Like, the second act seems to go into an almost unrelated section of anything. So, like, Returns feels like this really disconnected narrative that, yeah. because that first act is so weak, it makes it fucking impossible to recommend. By the way, I just confirmed I do, in fact, have a uh, copy of Planescape Torments. Nice. GOG. I haven't got around to playing it, but I've heard good things about... Uh, Shadowrun Hong Kong. I've heard it's better I have than as well. Returns. Um, I have another... There's another Shadowrun, too, I think. Um, Dragonfall. Yes, that's right. That was, like, the expansion for Returns. Yeah. I never How got... How was that? Did you, did you play that, Johan? Yeah, the, the Harebrained Schemes Dragon Run games are really, like, the only... Or Shadowrun games are pretty much the only games of that general genre that I kind of tolerate, if that makes any sense. It's just nor- it, no, that's like it's normally does. not my style of gameplay. Uh, I'm not very much in the point-and-click uh, style. I'm, I'm very more focused on action-e games. I get bored easily otherwise, and it's not a criticism <laughs> of games. It's just you know, what I'm into. Personal no, it's just, it's, it doesn't gel with you. Um, yeah. It's just, I guess, the way the, the newer Shadowrun games... Especially the second and third, Dragonfall and Hong Kong. Uh, mechanically, those work really well with me compared to every other game in that general genre that I've played. So, can I uh, can I ask you a question about why that might be? Why? Or oh, go ahead. Oh, XCOM. Are you at all familiar with XCOM? Hmm. Because like the mechanics of the new these newer Shadowrun games are basic. It's basically a very light version of what XCOM does. Right, and I have played the XCOM game. I like the XCOM game, but I struggle with the logistics side, half of the new XCOM games, I should say. I struggle with the logistics side of things. I'm not a numbers person in games. Uh, So I take it you don't do um, Fire Emblem as well? No, I do not. (laughs) How about Valkyria Chronicles? Have you given that a shot? Yes, I do. I have been playing through that, um... I think that one has just enough of a, not necessarily action-y, but 
direct feel to it that I can stomach it and I enjoy it. It's more real time oriented, isn't it? Right, kind of. It. I actually more. I really, I really like how it was a very interesting hybrid of turn based and real time play. That sounds yeah. appealing to me, definitely. Yeah, and I really I'm like how it boat. turned out. Yeah, it's it, like the the combat uses a turn based model. Like you move, and um, while you move, enemies can shoot at you for like really really light damage. So if you're moving in front of um, an enemy, you're going to be taking some hits, so you've got to use cover and stuff like that. And then when you fire, they stop firing. You have the opportunity to actually aim and take your shots. And uh, then that unit's turn is over, and you use, like, a command point. You can move them again and make them do multiple moves in one turn, but they use gradually more command points. So it's best to actually, like, make full use of all your units the characters are really charming. I really liked um, the like bit I've played of Valkyria Chronicles, and I should go back to it. Also, it's gorgeous. It's got like this beautiful, beautiful watercolor um, style to it. Is there some supernatural watercolor. element to that game? Because for some reason, my brain keeps yelling werewolves at me right now, and I don't know where I'm getting. There's at no from. werewolves, as far as I can tell, but there is like some anime bullshit. Definitely, Definitely some anime bullshit. I mean, there's. Uh, there's 100% some anime bullshit. Um, I don't know where I got werewolves from, ooh. then. I don't know. Can I talk to you all about some anime bullshit? Absolutely. I've been watching some anime bullshit. What you been watching? I've been watching um, Ajin, Demi-Human. I am not familiar. Tell me about it. Okay. It's a Netflix series about... Um, Netflix original? Yeah, it's a Netflix original series. Okay. Um, it is... Um, Basically, these I don't I don't know how to fully describe the Ajin, but these thi- I'm going to say things that feels bad, but I'm going to say things. Um, these things called the Ajin have been discovered, kind of like living among humans, and they can't be killed. Is the thing about them? All right. Um, and so when an Ajin is discovered. Because they're still relatively new to the world, governments are on the hunt for them. And, you know, there's been footage of, like, footage released in this context of, like, the government performing experiments on the Eugene by killing them over and over and just watching them resurrect and trying to figure out how that works. Sounds it's, about right so far. It is a, an utterly fascinating series so far. Really great characters. Interesting animation style. Um, it's using like, it's using full 3D models and then animating them in such a way that it does just still look like hmm. hand-drawn anime. The soundtrack is incredible. It's a really, really great series. I actually would recommend checking it out at this point. Be wary. Um, I'm early into the first season. Uh, there is definitely some scenes which um, depict... I'm going to say distur- disturbing scenes of torture is what I'm going to say okay. are in the um, is in that first season. Um, prolonged disturbing scenes of torture. It's definitely worth so noting. That's if that's not uh, something that you are willing to stomach. I would say maybe avoid a gene. Otherwise, right now I'm going to say that's some good anime bullshit. Also, Little Witch Academia is very good. You said it's uh, you said it's 3D animated, right? Yeah, it's like 3D animated. Is it the same studio, or is it similar to that, I believe it was Knights of Sidonia that they have on there? Uh, I believe it is a different studio from Knights of Sidonia. Okay, because I'd be, I, I'm definitely interested now in at least taking a look at it, because I like, I have no problem with, th- with the concept of 3D animation and anime, but I think a lot of studios do it wrong because they try and animate it exactly the same way that they animate on paper, including stuff where, like, hmm. Like, you know, they animate dialogue scenes at lower frame rates than they animate, say, fight scenes. A dialogue scene could theoretically be as low as six to eight frames a second, while a combat scene will be up to the full 24 that film typically will be. Right, yeah. But, so so they do the same thing in these 3D models, is they'll animate, like, discussion scenes at six frames a second on a 3D model, and it just looks... 
It bothers me. I think that's my problem with that Knights really of Sidonia shit. Nailed it. I think Ajin has really nailed it for what it's worth. I okay. haven't watched Sidonia. I I do want to check it out, and I also want to check out Blame. Um, I've heard I've heard good things about Blame. And like I, I also mentioned, Little Witch Academia. That the series is out. Little Witch Academia is really good. I've heard good um, stuff about that. Yes, it's very it's so cute. God, it's so cute. I think the last anime oh. I watched was a. Uh... I watched the first season of Attack on Titan. Oof. Ha. Ah, doof. Ah. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I didn't, mm. my friend kept putting it on when I was in the room. It was one of those things where like I'm passively observing it. I never sought it out. Uh, right. I stayed in a hotel room a couple months ago and Toonami like marathon through a bunch of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. So I've watched like half of the dub of that nowadays. JoJo's fucking sick. I love JoJo's. JoJo. I want to watch more JoJo. It was wild. Yeah, no, it's buck wild. It was, it's such a good it series. It was fucking wild, the one I saw. Like... I also... I, I wrote a, a, a... Okay, actually, you make your point. I've got a thing i got to pull up. I'm thinking about it. I something. was literally just going to ramble on just a slight bit more about how JoJo's fucking crazy. He hit that man with a steamroller. Oh, God. Muda, 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 muda. Um, okay. What you got for us? So, I, I, I got the thing, I got the thing I wanted. Here's a question for both of you. Yes. Do you guys have a genre of media that's like really hard for you to get into? Hmm. I don't um, really care that much about TV shows. Honestly and truly. No, I'm meaning, I'm just meaning anything. Like, Sci-fi, fantasy, like that's sort oh, of like narrative uh, genre. I definitely struggle getting into fantasy. So, Same. Like it, it can feel really stuffy in general. Consuming fantasy, like high fantasy, low fantasy, heroic fantasy, whatever. There's something stuffy about it that I just can't tolerate. Mm. At a certain point, no, no, what were you were saying? Uh, I don't know if I uh, if I have a uh, genres that I specifically feel any kind of aversion or a hard time getting into definitely generic high fantasy anything that feels like it's uh sniffing tolkien's farts way too much it's just <laughs> boring <laughs> you know that's I'm, a great way to yeah, describe you know exactly that exactly what i'm talking about it's like every high elf is the same and every goblin and every dwarf and i know how this is gonna all go everybody read or have watched you heard Lord of the, Rings the high much. elves <laughs> have you heard of the high elves Oh, those ah. are incredible. Oh. That ah. Batman is a champion. Have you seen the newest one that came yes. out like a week or two ago? <laughs> the oh, wait, shit, is there a new one? backwards in the water. It's Someone, exactly oh, the God. same. Someone, Please send me a link to this while I can, so I can like have a look at this immediately. Absolutely. Someone pointed out to me, um, because he jumps in a pool, he's completely dry before he jumps in the pool. That was the first take. He did that in one take on the first take because he's an absolute champion. God damn. I'm sending this in the group right now. Oh, I just had okay, it looked cool. up myself. Okay. There it is. I'm just going to l- wait for a reaction. Yeah, let, I'm going to let you have this. Dead air is good for radio time, right? People like when you don't talk. <laughs> this video is about 30 God. seconds, folks. People can hear it. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> so it's not dead air. Yeah, I felt a little no, awkward it's not with dead complete air. dead air. But that's good. Yeah. You'll notice he was completely dry. <laughs> he did that on the first take. Jesus Christ. I... It's... It, mm. it bothers me how dead on he is. Because, like... I put about 400 hours into Oblivion on the 360. And this man clearly has put in more time into the game than I have. <laughs> the voice act, the voice acting chops <laughs> are real. He he's got it memorized. It's fucking it's so good. Uh Oblivion. Watch how he just shows it's, it's interesting. Up. Watch how he shows up as a voice credit in the next Skyrim remaster. Oh god. The next Skyrim no, he's remaster. Show up in like one of- <laughs> He's going to show up in one of the, like, fan projects that's like, oh, yeah, we're going to put the Oblivion map inside of Skyrim. 
It's like, sure you are. It's never coming out at this point. I love those conceptually. Like, I remember when I was when I was younger and I'd get excited when I'd see, we're, you know, for Grand Theft Auto, back when San Andreas was the newest game, we're putting all of Liberty City from 3 and all of Vice City in, and they never finished, like you said. It's just too ambitious. No, yeah, like, it's... Skywind, it's never going to finish. I'm sorry, guys. I love it conceptually, though. I absolutely understand the drive to do it. No, yeah, totally. I, I think that's fantastic, but I, I, I don't know that there's long-term kind of sustainability in those projects, not because of like a lack of audience or anything, but just because eventually people got to make money. Yeah. I think the only time I've ever seen anything approaching that actually succeed and come out as a fully realized mod was uh, A Tale of Two Wastelands, which didn't even do that quite. All it did was it found a way to basically merge Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas into a single game. Yeah. Yeah. Which, now, and that's a, Sorry, you go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't know what I was going to say. <laughs> well, I was just going to say... Um, so we're not complete downers on the concept. Uh, someone did pull this off somewhat successfully recently with Skyrim. They introduced uh, a mod that brought uh, Bruma from from uh, from Oblivion. I'm trying to remember these areas exactly. But it brought in at least one region of Oblivion. It brought in new voice acting, new music. Uh, and it came out rather oh, recently. yeah, I think I remember hearing about this stuff. I'm taking a moment huh. to try and Google it just so I can give some more exact details if I can come across it. Well, while we do that, I want to like I want to quickly hit on this. Yes. So like the genre of media that we have like trouble getting into, like fantasy, like fantasy is my thing too. Like magic is cool, sure. Like I love I love when magic takes the forefront. Like Little Witch Academia is really cool because magic is very much the forefront, yeah. and it's like fantasy slice of life. Which is super duper cool. I love that conceptually. Oh, yeah. The idea that the but, world just exists with this and it's not like a weird thing. Yeah, but like a lot of fantasy design all just kind of comes together. Like you said, it's like people just trying to fucking sniff Tolkien's farts. Yeah, it's because... It's a lot of that. I think a lot of it is just because that is the prevalent cultural conception of these things. Like... To, to many people, there is no touchstone for an elf. And uh, what was I? Hmm. I was watching a YouTuber, uh, Foldable Ideas. Uh, Dan Olson, okay. I believe, is his name. He was Yes, that's, I, that is, I believe, his yeah. name. Uh, he was streaming the game Too Human, which I'm not going to defend Too Human by any stretch of the imagination. But they have these... Sorry, can I stop you for a moment here real quick yes. for a Too Human related story? Absolutely. I was at Silicon Knights when Too Human was being developed. Hmm. That's real. Hmm. We're going to have That's to talk real. about this so we don't violate NDA on a stream in front of everyone. Oh, no, 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 no. There's no NDA. I wasn't working there. Are you kidding me? I'm 22 years old. Wait, why were you? I visited when I... Oh, you're just there I was visiting the studio. I Yeah, I was at Silicon Knights because it was the game development studio in the town that I was growing up in. It was the studio. It was... The thing that existed because they were working on Too Human and we were there and we got to see an early demo of Too Human. I remember that and I remember thinking, oh shit, this Norse mythology shit is so fucking cool. And then I was like, oh, I bet you Too Human is going to be really oh, good. No. Turns out it was a bad game, but like I was there when Too Human was being developed. That is That's Buck wild that is, to me. Like, you literally can't own... Well, you can own that game, but you can't buy that game. You can't sell that game anymore. All copies of yeah, it were no. supposed to have been destroyed. That, like... Shit. Yeah, because they sued... They sued Epic, claiming, like, oh, they... They messed us up with the Unreal Engine in order to try and sabotage the game to make Gears of War what? look better. This is 1,000% true. This is their claim, because originally... Well, Two Human has a long development history. Two Human was originally a PlayStation One game. No what joke. The fuck? It was like a it was like a detective game based in the future. It was like Minority Report. Then it became what? yes. Then it became a GameCube game, and that's I think where the Norse mythology started dipping in. And then Silicon Knights. I don't know if they got bought by Microsoft or they signed some contract, but that's when it turned to a 360 game. Um. They they signed a deal with Epic to use Unreal Engine, 
worked on the game for a while, then announced that they weren't going to use Unreal Engine. They were going to use their own uh, in-house engine. Then sued. I think that's the point at which I witnessed oh, the game too. And then they sued. I Epic. think I saw it when they had it on the like their in-house engine. They sued Epic, like, saying that their experience with Unreal Engine was bad because Epic wanted to uh, to hold back competing developers in order to fund Gears of War with Unreal Engine sales and make Gears of War look better. So then Epic files a countersuit claiming that, hey, you know that original engine you claim to have built? We don't think it's so original. Epic wins that set case because it was a highly modified version of Unreal Engine 3. Every, two human was court-ordered, removed from sale, every existing copy recalled, and destroyed. What? what? Yes. The fuck? I, I assumed that only indie developers got into situations that convoluted. That's the most fucking buck wild thing I've ever heard about a video game. The the what? tale of two human and Dennis Didak is is a long storied fantastic one, to the point to where uh, I was I was referencing uh Dan Olson because um, and I'll get back to that original point, but he talked about how he saw Dennis Didak has a copy of two human and he was just wondering to himself is he legally allowed to own that considering he was required to destroy every copy of the game. It's it's absolutely huh. absurd. But my I had a by the way, yes. I had a Silicon Knights shirt at one point. Ooh. And I'm mad I lost that now. That that would be a nice that's like a, show thing, if nothing else. That's like a piece of history. Honestly and truly. They made one good game. They made one good game. How'd they do that? What was the good game that they made? I like Eternal Darkness. Oh yeah, you know what? They also worked on the they they worked on the remaster of Metal Gear. Oh Solid. yeah, Twin Snakes. They I'll give them credit for Fucking that. I'll give them that. credit for that because that was some a somewhat. I mean, obviously they worked on it, but they did a fair amount of design work redoing that. So I'll give them credit for yeah, that. Yeah, I, I I played the I played the Twin Snakes. It's good. Uh, it's it's good. It's it's just it's, it's different. It's just a different take on it. It's a nice alternate take, kind of like talking about anime bullshit. How you have Evangelion and the rebuild of Evangelion. It's just different right. take. Evangelion's a bad series, by the way. That's my hot nah, take. No, actually, Evangelion is a really good series, and that's my hot take for my entire life. <laughs> the, my my hot take is Evangelion is not as good as everybody is uh, willing to give it credit for. I think. I think it's better than people give it credit for. Well, no, it is. It's it's as good as people give it credit for, but people give it credit for being good for the wrong reasons. Hmm. I think. Okay, I, that's I think an, a lot that's of people don't get take. Evangelion to the point to where the entire reason end of Evangelion exists is because of how much the, the fan base did not get Evangelion. Well, we also have to remember that the, like a lot of the symbolism that was also just used throughout Evangelion was all bullshit because they thought it, oh, like, Christian, the Christian symbology made it look cool. So... So I, I realize this is a podcast about video games and not about anime. So. Yeah, we've not gone to the anime Evangelion. hour, but it's fine. <laughs> so I don't know if I should go into it but so much. But basically, Evangelion, the original series, ignore how it was uh, hamstrung by its budget issues. It ends on a rather positive note. The viewer is, is supposed to self-insert to Shinji and see how Shinji overcomes the darkness inside his own mind. The audience did not do that. They sent death threats to Gainax, destroyed their building, and tried to ruin the series forever. So the end of Evangelion comes out, and it goes, okay, if Shinji's the self-insertion character, and y'all weren't happy with how we did it before, here he is now. Look how much he sucks. Look how terrible he is while everyone dies around him. And to... It, do you like this? And to lab- is this what you wanted? And to labor this point, end of Evangelion repeatedly takes moments to... Keep in mind seeing this as in a movie theater as they imagine you seeing it. To repeatedly show the audience looking back at itself. To try and drive home the point like Shinji is you. Shinji is you and we tried to give you a good ending. We tried to be optimistic but y'all fucking suck and here's what you wanted the whole time. So yeah, I think a lot of people don't get Evangelion. And I think the, de- and I think the producers of Evangelion agree with me. <laughs> That that's the anime segment of Pausecast this week, and I will not bring it back next time in my ghost edit. 
Mm. See, that's a that's Actually, a recall I like the, to the I original like the series. anime minute. This is this is good. This is good. <laughs> this is good content. Is the thing about it. And like we could talk about more anime bullshit. Like I could I could probably pull up some stuff about Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm Collection. Hey, those are some cool games. I have like I actually like I the reason I picked up the original Ultimate Ninja Ninja Storm was like oh yeah it has the original Naruto storyline. I've not finished that and I got part way in it. Those games seem about a really good way to experience like a condensed version of the storyline. That seems accurate, actually. Yeah. And it, there's some pretty cool fighting bullshit that happens oh, in the middle, too, I guess. Absolutely. I think they're I also have the, the One Piece Warriors game. Just one of them. It's the Guilty Gear people that are making that new Dragon Ball Z game that's coming out, right? I think so. God, it looks so oh, good. See, earlier we were talking... I had my complaints about anime, like 3D anime that tries to animate like 2D anime. The new Dragon Ball Fighters is an example of doing it right. That game looks like the TV show. Yeah, no, it does. It's absolutely astonishing what they've managed to achieve. Yeah, I'm I'm incredibly excited about it. I'm more excited for that. Like, that's my follow-up to Marvel 3. I'm going to get that instead of Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Yeah, I've I've heard MVCI is actually not all that good, it's... but also like I just don't like Marvel or Capcom all that much. Yeah. So grain of salt, people. I've never been much of a fighting game player, but Marvel Three got me really hard hardcore. I like that game a lot. I I I've never really like been too into fighting games. Like yeah, I've gotten a little bit into Street Fighter Five because I like. It's good for more casual players. Like my biggest, my biggest concern with fighting games has basically always been accessibility. Oh, that's like definitely. I got I got really into Smash because I could get good at that, and like everybody had a consistent move set that didn't rely on convoluted combos and yeah. stuff. So it made Smash an accessible game for me to get into, even semi competitively. Yeah, and then uh, like. Street Fighter Five was just insur like Street Fighter in general is just insurmountable to me because of the like fucking obscure combo systems, and when when I say obscure, I mean like yeah they're in the combo list, but also like it takes takes a huge amount of skill to be able to pull those off, let alone without like buying several hundred dollar controllers for it. Yeah. So like fuck off with that bullshit. Now that give me give me a fighting game I can play with my controller. Now see, I think Marvel 3 actually did a pretty good job of that because everyone uses kind of the same set of inputs. It's just learning what each input does. So like everyone's got a Hadouken yeah. move. Everyone's got a Shuriken move. That's, it's like the Smash kind of situation. Yeah. I think Smash is 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 a fantastic fighting game, especially because of what you just list like the reason you just listed. It's accessibility. Outside of, like, Evo-tier pros, you can put someone who has put almost no time into the game against someone who plays it a lot, and they have almost an equal chance in terms of, like, stock settings. And I think that's Mm. fantastic. Yeah, even playing fields are, like, good, as it turns out. Yeah, accessibility is good. People give Smash shit for, like, oh, it's a party game. And sure, maybe... Fine, I'll give you that. Like, it's definitely a game that's intended for groups. Yeah. And, like, getting together with your friends and, like, doing some, like, couch fighting. It's a little bit more casual, but the playing field also being even isn't a bad fucking thing. It's actually good. Absolutely. And when you're having to lean into uh, controller defects and you literally quit tournaments because you have a controller, because you can't find a controller that's broken the right way... Melee is bullshit. Listen, if you play Melee, get the fuck out of here. I, this is, Don't speak This to is me. a hot take I can get behind. Stop this, trying this to make Smash it's something you, it's not. Stop trying to make Smash something yeah. it's not. Listen, you, wanna, you, you like Melee? Do you like playing it competitively? Fuck off. <laughs> get the fuck out of here. This is not my leave, podcast. Leave, I don't... leave the Smash community to like a better game like smash 4 like leave it to that there's an improved version of the game i don't know if you've heard <laughs> smash 4 is out brawl exists, oh you mean project by m the way, also 
M- no, I mean stock brawl. Yeah. I like stock brawl better than melee. Fuck melee. Wow. Look, this is not my podcast. I don't have to. I don't have to own up to these. I don't have to. I don't have to deal no, with the you, consequences. You don't have to own up to that opinion. This is mine. My opinion is brawl is actually better than melee, and it has been the whole time. The subspace emissary also fucking rules. Don't at me. I thought it was pretty fun. It, it was a little. It was a little boring, but I liked it. It's whack as shit. But, like, it's good. I enjoy my time with it's it. It's good. Oh. <laughs> We've had some hot takes today. It's been some, spicy. This has been good. This has been a longer episode than normal, too. Like, we got spicy. <laughs> this is good. Hot takes coming through. Mm. Hot takes. All right, people. That's it for this. All right. Whatever this was. Thanks. A mess. Um... It, no, that's a disaster every week. Trust me, believe me. As long as we had it's a good just, time, I think that's what's important. Not the time. listeners. This has Ooh, been good. Yeah. No, f- no, okay. Now, see, once again, not no. my podcast. I can say whatever I want. And you, nah, see you. <laughs> Leave call. <laughs> no. Remember to don't, dislike, yeah, don't, unsubscribe, don't do that. and we never got comment. some stuff to wrap up. <laughs> so, Beautiful hey. listeners, you're all fantastic. Thanks for listening to some content. This has been content. Hashtag. Um, hashtag content. Yard Gnome. That's me. That's you. <laughs> Where are you online? Where can people find you? Actually, no, sorry. Mm-mm. I'm going too far into the route. Oh, no. What are you looking forward to play? What are you looking forward to playing this week? Uh, this week, I'm definitely going to be playing more Battlegrounds. I'm going to dive yes. further into the Crash Bandicoot collection. Um, I think that's about it, honestly and truly. And probably some more Warframe. There's not a lot new going on. Oh, I'm probably going to be playing some Destiny as well, because if you're a Destiny player, I know two of us here are. Uh, the Age of Triumph is wrapping up. We're coming to like our last time to get a lot of your book stuff done, and I'm out here trying to get that t-shirt. There's no fucking way I'm going to be able to do it, so... It's, it's, like, I'm hoisted. Yeah, I'm not much of a Crucible player, and like half the book is Crucible, so I'm, I'm struggling. Oof. But yeah, Battleground, um, some some uh, Master Mode, some Crash Bandicoot, and I guess you could say I'm looking forward to playing more Destiny. Some Destiny. Good shit. Johan? Um, I'm looking into just scouring more into some of the side content of uh, Nier Automata, um, and definitely more PlayerUnknown's Battleground after I sort of run out of stuff to play in the single-player game that I obsess with. Um, yeah. That's pretty much it that I can think of for the foreseeable future, but uh, yeah. Gonna get into some deep existential nice. questions with Nier and get into some murder with Battlegrounds. I think that's well-rounded. I think, yeah, I think that's good. Absolutely. Um, I am gonna be Battlegrounds. Um, <laughs> I've Planet Coaster. I've been uh, doing some stuff in that. So I'm probably gonna continue just doing that. There's not a lot to talk about from Planet Coaster other than it's just it's really good, but it's really complicated. Um, you got to make the follow up to Mr. Bones' Wild Ride. Ooh. <laughs> Maybe. I have to find the original Mr. Bones' Wild Ride, first of all. <laughs> and then I can uh, do that. Um, Battlegrounds, Planet Coaster. Uh, what am I. Hmm. There's been some stuff I've been thinking about maybe getting into recently. I don't know. What you got on your mind? I'll have to I've see. heard you been you said I, I going through a backlog. Yeah. Um possibly maybe Valkyria. Valkyria is like I've got that itch again. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a save with about eight hours on uh, PS4, so I might jump into that. It's like twenty bucks on the PS4, by the way. If you can afford it, like it's a good ass video game. Did any of the sequels to that make it out of Japan? Uh, yes, you can get a few of them on, like, they're not on consoles, yeah. but, like, you could get, like, Valkyria 2 and 3, I think, on Vita. If you're, like, me and you're one of the, excuse me, two people who owns Vita, you can get those, uh, via the PS store. Did you just find it on the street or something? Uh, at some point. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how I found it. It's just, it's been, it's entered into my life. I have Persona 4 on it. Hey, it sounds like a good That's time. Really, all I need. Um, 
So, I think that actually does bring us into the wrap-up of the show. Um, yeah, I'll do... Okay, here's what I'm going to yeah. do. First, the show is on Patreon. If you like this content, uh, and you might not like it this week, sorry if we uh, got a little <laughs> spicy. You might not like this content, but uh, if you do like this content, thank you. Uh, if you would like to financially support this content, you can do so because we are on Patreon. We are patreon.com slash podcast show or bit.ly slash podcast. We'll also take you there. And if um, I may, thank you if I may real our... quick, support Patreon, mm-hmm. like give a dollar. And I'm not even saying like specifically to this show. If, if like a hundred people gave a dollar to all your Patreons, like we'd all be living life out here. We got to redistribute the wealth. Support what you love, and let's 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 do well. Support, let's support what you love because it feels good, and also because we'll give you we'll give you bonuses. Yeah, let's build, fam. Okay, let's build. Thank you to our patrons who exist in this world: Noah Holmes, Ash Yee, and PD. Thank you for your support of the show. It means a lot. We are elsewhere on the internet. Facebook.com slash podcast show. Tumblr.com, we're podcast show. That's podcast show.tumblr.com. Uh, we're on iTunes, bit.ly slash podcast dash iTunes. If you're listening on iTunes, please give us a rating, give us a review. It helps us out a lot. Uh, and it also makes me feel good to re- read uh, the reviews. <laughs> um, I get an email about those occasionally, so thank you very much. Um, oh, yeah, and we're mostly on Twitter. We're mostly on Twitter. Twitter.com slash podcast show. I'm on Twitter as well. But first, Yard Gnome, where are you at? Uh, where are you online? You might find me on this thing called the internet. Uh, on Twitter or Tumblr are my most forward-facing social medias. At Yard Gnome 736. Can you uh, say that again just for the stream? You cut out a little bit on my uh, end. Uh, uh, yeah, you can find me at Twitter or on Tumblr at Yard Gnome 736 if you want that hashtag quality good content. Quality good content. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Johan, where are you at on the uh, internet? You can mostly find me on Twitter at EXA Meter. At EXA Meter. Um, yeah. And you can find me online at Cockatiel Cutie. You can no longer find me at bird.school. I'm going to work on something new for uh, bird.school, but I've retired my Tumblr this week. Just wasn't getting a lot out of it, so I've actually gone and retired. It's probably for the best. We'll, probably. <laughs> uh, we'll, I'll figure out a new use for that URL. I might get my um, I might get my writing. Yeah, that's pointed at that's that. a good URL. Don't just sit on that. Yeah, I can't just sit on bird.school. Are you kidding Fantastic. me? Fantastic. It's such a good URL. Um, what else is good? Uh, oh, I don't know what else is good right now. We have YouTube archives of the show. Um, it's on my YouTube channel for now. And we're just like YouTube and Twitch are kind of an experiment for podcast still at the moment. So we're continuing to, um, I'm continuing to work on that and see where we're at. Um, you can find those on YouTube if you have any interest. It's just, uh, these past few episodes full archives forthcoming at some point possibly i don't know we'll see maybe that's a patreon goal nah maybe yeah maybe i can hmm hmm i don't know huh you you got me thinking you got me thinking all right that is uh that's gonna do it for us i believe this week Got any? Do you have anything else that you guys want to pop in? Any last closing thoughts before we head off? Um, join the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, that works for me. I can endorse that message. Yeah, join your local DSA chapter. Uh, and if you're not in America, join some other socialist organization. I'm sure you can find yep. something. <coughs> Industrial in workers. Oh in yeah, the world. if you're in New Zealand. <coughs> Oh, IWW, Ooh, okay. fantastic. Um, 
you can also get involved maybe with uh, prison abolitionism. Uh, no pride in prisons. Check oh, them out. That hey, that's great. No pride in prisons is very good. Absolutely, as it turns out, they're uh, they're they're an NZ based organization doing some quality fucking work. Um, thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for listening to the uh, Marxism <laughs> section. I can't uh, help of it. The show as I well. can't help it. It's in my no, blood. Gotta push out that propaganda right at the end. Seriously. Mm, yeah, it's so good. Follow me online All right, for more. That's it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> follow us for some dank socialism. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us. Thank you very much. Thank and you. We'll see you next week. Peace. Bye. Bye.